God of wisdom and grace, you speak through your word, read and proclaim. Prepare us now to listen well. Open our ears to your truth. Humble us in your presence, God, so nothing will stand in the way of what you will say to us today. Amen. The first lesson is from Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 2, 8, 9, and 22, 23, and can be found on page 604 of the Old Testament pew in the Bible, if you'd like it to follow along. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. A favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. They do not rob the poor because they are poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their case and despoils of life those who despoil them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen now for God's word to you this day. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes, and say, here, have a seat, please. While to the other one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised? to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time in Turkey, there lived a funny little wise man named Nazaretine Hoka. He wore a huge white turban and worn out coat made of patches upon patches. After helping a neighbor with a dirty job, he arrived at his friend's house so poorly dressed that they hardly even recognized him. Their lack of reception disappointed him for they showed partiality and favoritism only to those who were well-dressed. So Nazaretine goes home to clean up and put on his finest silk coat. Upon his second arrival to the banquet, he is welcomed enthusiastically. He picks up a lamb chop and starts feeding it to his coat, saying, eat, coat, eat. And he begins to pick up the dishes at all, at all the dishes on the table. And he opens up his coat and he feeds his coat with the food. Everyone stares at him. 
And finally, the host asks him what he is doing. The Nazarene responds, surely you wanted my coat to eat. When I first arrived in my old coat made of patches upon patches, there was no food for me. Yet when I came back in this new coat, there was every kind of food for me. This shows that it was the coat and not the man, not me, that you invited to the banquet. The Hungry Coat by Demi. It's a fabulous folktale illustrating the point that James made in the New Testament long ago. Gold rings and fine clothes, fancy coats, whether we are favoring the well-heeled or just people who look like us, we could use the reminder to treat the rich and the poor alike as, as did the early Christians. To believe God as creator means that we can't create a human hierarchy when we consider which neighbor deserves our love and attention. In Proverbs, one of the books of wisdom literature in the Old Testament, we learn those who are generous are blessed for they share their bread with the poor. Blessed because they are generous in their act of sharing with the poor. Faith with works is alive. The act of sharing, the generous work is the reason for the blessing. They are not blessed because they have something to give. They are blessed because of what they do with what they have. The action blesses them. As James asks, what good is it if you say you have faith but do not have works? From the giving, the doing, the feeding emerges the blessing. To be included among the generous, to keep faith alive, it helps to consider with whom we share bread these days. Or rather, what do we feed? Do we feed coats? gold rings and fancy clothes and retirement accounts? Do we feed our egos? Do we feed privilege? We weren't created to feed such things, for the things of this world and the people in it are temporary. We are invited to hold lightly that which passes away so that we might have the chance to participate in the eternal. When we feed the poor, so to speak, then we help extend God's blessing. I'd go further than Nazarene and say that it's not even about the flesh and blood person wearing the coat. He too will pass, but it's about feeding one's spirit, one's soul. As St. Augustine put it, the God shaped vacuum whose appetite can only be filled by an act of faith. When we listen to God's word and hear the command to love our neighbors, then it matters who we serve at the table. For to be blessed is to nurture one another in the name of God, rather than in the name of anyone or anything else. James convicts us all. He knows that we are a judgmental people by nature. He doesn't mean to deprive a certain population. He knows everyone needs to eat. He just seeks to hold a mirror up so that we have to take a good look at the company we keep. You shall love your neighbor. Here he quotes Leviticus in the Old Testament and Jesus in the Gospels. James sees the easy ways that we fall into societal norms, for it stifles the truth of the gospel in the name of exclusivity. Acts of favoritism, showing partiality, we are guilty of these things, but not hopeless. James helps us identify the places that we haven't put faith into action so that we can experience redemption. Surely some of those early Christians had heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the tale of the 
beat up man on the street whose neighbors keep walking by and ignoring him, but whose international foe stops to help him? Who is our neighbor? Scripture causes us to expand the definition of neighbor so widely that it cannot be contained to a church or a county or a country. Last week, we remembered that we came into the world as recipients, which means we have plenty to give. This week, we remember that God's blessings cannot be shared in a discriminatory way. For God so loved the world, not just our family and friends. God nurtures us all with the bread of life. God honors every single person on this earth through Jesus Christ. When he came into the world, when he taught us life lessons, when he died on the cross and was raised to new life. Today we come to the Lord's table, remembering that the company that Jesus kept wasn't any more worthy than we are to be invited here. And when we internalize the truth that the invitation is a gift, regardless of what we are wearing, then we begin to understand that we cannot fence this table. We cannot keep people away. This is the most inclusive meal in the world. All are welcome to the Lord's table. And as we partake of the elements that link us to Jesus' body and blood, we let go of our judgments, our favoritism, our partialities so that we might become one with God and with one another. Faith is the first step that allows us to accept this holy meal. The works that emerge from the faith that is fed here help us to keep Jesus Christ alive in the world. In the last chapter of John, the resurrected Christ speaks to Peter just after giving the poor man some bread. Jesus affirms his love and commands Peter to feed his lambs. He doesn't say feed the rich lambs and ignore the poor ones, nor does he say feed the poor and ignore the rich. He just says, take this bread. I love you. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. At this point, Peter has been following Jesus for long enough that Jesus doesn't need to distinguish for him which sheep and lamb make up a holy flock. He just sums it up with two words that are just as powerful for us today. Follow me. When we follow Jesus to the table, we follow the man not the coat. Thanks be to God. Amen.